This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf, your host. And actually today, I am not only the host, but also the guest. So it's a Deb Wolf show. I get a lot of requests to do this, to do a show, just me talking about dogs and cats and how they think and how they work and the strange things I've learned about them over the years. So today's the day. I'm going to talk first about dog body language. I know people find it very puzzling. They often can't tell if a dog is playful or aggressive. And it is tricky. It definitely is. So if you're having problems with this, you might want to check out my YouTube site, Deb Wolf Pet Expert on YouTube, where I've shown dogs communicating, where I actually show the whole section on body language and how our body language can calm them or disrupt them or take charge of them or signal to them. And so if you're looking to figure out why your dog unexpectedly does things, why you can't seem to predict, then this is what you should do. Check out my my YouTube. It's free. Just look at it and you'll see how to calm a nervous dog, how to approach an aggressive dog, how to signal to the dog what the dog needs to hear from you. And I'm also in the DVD and the video showing you and pointing out to you how the dog is signaling back when he cowers, when he stiffens, when he makes himself small, he's afraid and nervous. When he's big and tall, he's confident. And the difference between an alpha dog and a submissive dog and all of that is shown in the DVD. But one thing that's really easy for people to spot If you're wondering when your dog greets another dog, if there's going to be an argument or if they're going to get along, if they start to try to put their head higher than the other dog's head, that's a good sign that you're about to get some trouble. So when one dog kind of says, I'm taller than you, and the other dog says, no, I'm taller than you, and then the other one puts his head a little higher, he's stretching, 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 and he kind of puts his head over the back of the other dog's head, there's about to be a problem. This is a sign that neither dog wants to be shorter. Both of them want to be top dog, tall dog in charge. And so you're best to just pull the leash and keep on walking. Tell your dog to heal and keep on walking because if they both want to be king of the park, you're going to have a problem. And that's how it usually starts this. My head's bigger than your head. I'm taller than you are. Bam. And then there's an explosion and people are so caught off guard because there was no growling. There was no barking. The dog's always been friendly before. And all of a sudden they're in a tussle and the leashes are flying if there are leashes. So, okay. So watch for that head posturing thing. Definitely. And head size means a lot to dogs. I know in, uh, in the human world, you know, men pump up to get muscular and, and women do too. And there's a lot of chest size and arm size and that kind of thing is sort of considered uh, sexually strong in humans. But in dogs, it's all about the head. (laughs) So the bigger the head, the bigger the jaw, the bigger the weaponry. So the big, big head dog with the big, big neck and the big ruff, he's king. Now, if he happens to be really short, that's a disadvantage because they're always trying to see who's the taller, who's the bigger. So that can play against him. So a corgi is not going to win over a small headed German shepherd, obviously, because he's too short. But two dogs the same size. The bigger the head, the bigger the guns, the bigger the jaw, the bigger the fight. Usually the smaller headed dog will defer. But that's one of the signs of what's going on with them when they compare head size. Sometimes you'll actually see dogs run at each other. This is usually young dogs, maybe under a year and a half. And they'll almost go to opposite ends of the field to do it. Like they're jousting, like old style uh, horsemanship, you know, where a guy on a horse, another guy on a horse with a a weapon, they charge each other. It's like that. And they'll literally run at each other on purpose, smash into each other just to see the force of the other dog, just to test his strength. And and sometimes they'll wind each other. Sometimes they even get a little bit hurt. They sometimes will do it several times. Who's stronger? Who's got more power? That's what they're testing. And it's usually adolescent dogs who are friends and they're just trying to establish their place in the pack. So packs, what about packs? Cats have packs. Dogs have packs. Cats' packs are different than dogs. In a cat 
colony, which is the proper word for it, or a cat family, if you will, because if you've got three or four cats, it's not exactly a colony. It's more of a family. They do have a hierarchy, but it's not as rigid or as linear as a dog hierarchy. Usually there is an alpha dog, king of all, and a submissive dog, bottom of the pack, usually. But in the cat world, that's not the case. Each one has its own position vis-a-vis the other ones. So there could be one cat who's picked on by several and yet bossy to another. And there's all kinds of intricate relationships in the cat world and gender does play a role. So oftentimes two male cats in in a cat family will have problems with each other, but get along with all the females. That's typical. What can you do to diffuse your cat issues? More litter boxes is the big one. If you have four cats and you have five litter boxes, you're likely not to have much conflict. But if you have four cats and one or two litter boxes, you're likely to have a lot of conflict. And the conflict may not play out as cat aggression. It may play out as destruction. So the cat wants to use the bathroom, but it can't because there's a cat lying in the way, giving it evil eye. It's too scared to cross because he knows it get attacked. So what does he do? Well, he has to go to the bathroom somewhere. That's where you get your destruction. He doesn't want to go on the carpet. He doesn't want to go on the floor. He doesn't want to hide it behind the sofa. He wants the litter box, but the litter box is unavailable. So that's why you need more litter boxes than cats if you can do it. And don't place them all in one spot. If all the litter boxes are in the basement and bully cat sits on the stairs, nobody can use the bathroom. It's a little bit like going to a big game. You know, you're going to a football game or baseball game and you really want to catch a game, but you got to go to the bathroom and you go and the lineup is so long. What are you going to do? Okay, your cat's not going to (laughs) wait. Your your cat, if he can't get to that litter box, your cat's going to go somewhere. So make sure your litter boxes are always accessible, even if you've got a bully cat that's trying to prevent the others. Well, we're going to go to a commercial break and come back. And let's see, what am I going to talk about next? Oh, I'm going to talk about how Ginger the Poodle learned German. Stay tuned on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, we're back on Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. So a little while ago, I told you about Ginger the Poodle, standard poodle, big size, and she's going on five, had a couple litters, and now she's retiring, and she went to her new family. And the new family, they picked her up and they took her for walks last year and they took her for outings and adventures and took her to her house, got her all used to everything. But now, now she's actually living with them. And that means she's living with grandma and grandma speaks German. Grandma can speak English, but she doesn't choose to. So Ginger had to learn German. And I was saying to the new owner, the son of grandma, I was saying to him, you know, I bet it'll take her an unbelievably quick amount of time, like a day. He said, are you sure? I don't know. Yeah, one day and Miss Ginger learned supper, treat, walk, good girl, go lay down, (laughs) and a couple of, oh, car ride, and uh, Chris is home. She learned all that in German in one day, which is just astounding. I mean, you know, dogs are so, so good at language. Cats are too, but they just don't necessarily pay attention as much. Dogs, if they want to know, if they want to learn, like Ginger wants to learn her new owner's ways. She wants to learn what they're saying to her. She's putting her entire poodle brain on this. And she learns its second language quicker than most humans. Just done. She can function fully in any language within a day or two, no matter where you send her. So we were talking about this a few shows ago, I think. We were talking about an elderly person who goes into care or, or passes away and then 
the dog needs to have a home. And in one case, the dog was sent from an English speaking family to a French speaking family. And the dog wasn't young. But so what? It learned not it learned French in a couple of days. No problem. So don't worry about that. And uh, if you do want to have some secrets, you can have secret commands with your dog. So, for example, if you happen to speak another language or you just want to look up on Google words in another language, you can teach your dog commands in that language. So no one else will know. Now, I do this a lot for going to the bathroom. You know, I'll teach a dog a word like pee pee or poo poo in there in a language that the family wants to use, you know, bathroom break. And so when they say that, the dog runs out and has a pee. If they're on a car trip or something, it's very clear to communicate to the dog, now's the time to go, right? And they don't have to yell out words that English speakers might find a little bit offensive. You know, go for a pee, buddy. Not everyone wants to shout that. But if you shout that in a foreign language, nobody knows what you're saying. <laughs> so it's much more discreet. And you can do things like growl. You can teach your dog to growl on command using a, a word that not everyone recognizes. And this I really like. Because if you're being followed or you feel insecure for whatever reason, you just say that word, your dog starts growling and whoever it is reconsiders. I'm telling you, they give you space. It doesn't even matter if your dog's medium sized or coiffed to the nines or wearing a sweater. A growling dog is a growling dog and they back off. They'll pick someone else. They'll go somewhere else. So that's a great command to teach your dog and you can do it with play. Just whenever you're teaching your dog to bark or growl as a trick, you want to make sure that you end with something positive. So you don't end with that. So if you get him barking on command, speak, 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 then you say quiet. And when he's quiet, good boy, give him the treat. So the quiet, the thing you like most often is the thing you reward the most. You still tell him he's good for barking on command or growling on command, but then you say, okay, enough be quiet, good dog, and give him the treat. And that way you never get a dog that's just barking excessively or growling just to get attention. He knows when to do it, when you tell him, and only when you tell him, and to stop when you tell him. So that's a very good tip for all of you out there. And I suggested that to the people who adopted Ginger, because even though she's this big fluffy poodle with beautiful coiffed hair, she looks like Barry Manilow. She's absolutely gorgeous, long golden tresses and all that. If she growls, I mean, she's a 55 pound dog. If she growls, people will listen. And if she's walking with grandma and grandma feels nervous and grandma says in German growl and Ginger growls, people will not bother grandma. And so I'm really happy with that. I am really happy with that. That's going to work out great. OK, so let's talk about cats. I don't think I've talked enough about cats today and we're coming up to a second break. So I should tell you about cats. One thing about cats is most people touch them much too hard and much too often when the cat is not interested. So the best way to get a cat to love being touched by you is it's almost like the way a performer leaves the crowd wanting more. If you yell encore, encore, encore really loud, they'll give you one and then they leave. They won't give you two or three. They make you yell it again. And if you don't yell it loud enough, they don't come back. That's what you have to do with your cat. Pet it a little bit and then walk away or withdraw your hands. Go back to doing what you were doing, watching TV, whatever it was. Your cat will come over. <laughs> Just don't give them quite enough. Give them a little less than what they want and they'll come back for more. So that's one clue. Usually people overwhelm them. They pick them up and they crowd them. If your cat loves you and is used to you and comfortable with you, it might like this, but it won't like it from strangers. So a stranger comes into the house and goes to pick up the cat and the cat thinks, what are you doing picking me up? Cat is a prey animal to most of the world. So it's often like little dogs hiding, escaping, trying to be secure and worried about its, its security. So the last thing it wants is for a big giant carnivore to pick it up, somebody it doesn't know. So instead, if you're meeting a cat you don't know, just look at it. Close your eyes for about two seconds and open them again. If the cat likes you and wants to meet you, it will mirror that. It will do that back to you. That is saying hello in cat. It will close its eyes and then open them again. Now, don't go approach the cat. Just sit down. The cat will approach you if it wants to. And then pet it for a little while as gently as you can. Make it push into you to get a stronger touch. Make it so gentle that the cat must want more. Use fingertip touch. And then just stop and the cat will want more. So that's my recommendation. If you've got an aloof cat or you just find cats don't like you and you love them and every time you approach them, they just don't like it, try this instead. 
Okay, we're going to go to break on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio, and I guess we're still talking about cats. So, sometimes it seems like cats have the ultimate life, you know? There's not much expected of them, really. Kill the odd mouse, which they like to do, and comes natural for them. Maybe give some affection to some people that they like, eat, use the litter box. Not a lot of requirements, and they sleep so much unbelievable amount of time. So domestic cats sleep an average of 16 hours per day. I would say it's higher. I think it's more like 18. If I look at my cats, they're barely awake and they are very nocturnal. So a lot of that sleeping is done during the day. (laughs) But oh man, can you imagine if you got 16 hours of sleep every day, what that would be like? I can't even imagine that. How well rested would you be? Wow, that's incredible. Dogs sleep almost as much. They sleep about 12 to 14. And puppies and kittens sleep more because they're growing. Just like kids. Kids sleep more because they're growing. They grow when they sleep. So if your dog or cat seems to be sleeping a lot, don't sweat it. That's normal. Okay. So, well, there is. Okay. I should say there are some cats with jobs. I kind of said cats don't do much. But there is one cat in Japan, Kyoto, that works on the police force. His name, I suppose it's in Japanese, but translated as Officer Lemon. And his job His whole job is to calm victims who've had really scary crank calls. So people who've been harassed by telephone get calmed by this cat. And there are quite a few cats calming kids in police stations all over North America. So we shouldn't we shouldn't demean the cat too much. And there are cats also, now that I think of it, in battle zones. And that's kind of a strange one. They use the cat to train the rats to not be afraid of cats so the rats can find the underground mines. Yeah, it's very complicated. Rats are the best at finding underground mines, and they can be trained to do so. But they get so freaked out at the idea that a predator might be around that they lose track of their task. So they find cats that are not interested in killing mice, which is not an easy task to find those cats, but they find those, and then they train the mice to not react to the cats so the mice can do their job and find the mines and not pay attention to predators. It's quite ingenious what humans can figure out about animals and how much we can get out of them. Imagine how many lives, animals and people, they're saving when they pull up landmines. You know, everyone who would walk in that area would be in danger, if not for those cats and those rats. So it's pretty amazing. As far as dogs go, people sure are attached. Apparently, there's an estimated one million dogs in America who are the primary beneficiaries of their owner's will. And I understand that because when you die, you don't want your dog to just be dumped or many dogs. What if you have a few? What if you're like Genghis Khan's son and you have like 500 mastiffs? Okay, well, not everyone has that. But even just your beloved cat or your dog that stood by you while you were sick, you don't want them being dumped. So it's very tricky. It's very tricky. But there are ways to do your will so that the money goes with the animal. So in, you don't end up in a situation where someone takes the money and dumps the animal so that the person who actually keeps caring for the cat or the dog gets the money to care for the cat or the dog and possibly something extra. So if you're thinking about this, definitely look into how to word the will, because there's been so many situations where somebody comes and it says in the will that they're the one to take the cat or they're the one to take the dog with a big chunk of money designed to 
allow them a place that allows dogs or cats, allow them to, you know, live in comfort while they take care of this animal and pay for the vet bills and the food and all of that. So the person takes the money and takes the cat or the dog to the pound. We don't want that. You don't want that. Make it conditional. And when you pick that person, instead of picking a person maybe that you love the most, pick a person that loves the pet the most because or loves pets the most. Someone you can truly count on for the life of the pet to want to care for that pet. That's my recommendation. Okay, so let's get on to some happier topics, I think. Well, more about cats. Cats do not like loud people. They don't like unpredictable noises and sudden movements. So that can mean a lot of cats are not so comfortable around children. So if you inherit a cat and you have kids, you want to start slow. Have the cat in one room. Have the kids come in calmly with you to visit for designated times in the day. Have them sit still and calmly talk, maybe read a book to the cat, maybe brush the cat with your help, but make sure that they're not just running around the house frantic and excited and running at the cat and picking up the cat and grabbing the cat and trying to dress up the cat and all of that in the first week. It'll happen, but you got to start slow. So that's true for adults too. The bigger the person, the scarier they are to a small animal. So if you're a big person with big noisy boots and you want to approach a cat that's afraid, Take off your boots, take off your hat, take off the things that make you a little bit scary, flapping clothes, noisy jewelry, all that won't bother the cat once it knows you. But in the beginning, you want to be quiet and calm and slow moving and predictable. And then you'll find the cat will really like you. So it's also a good idea to get the kids to feed the cat if you want the cat to like them. Now, it doesn't always work. You know, if you pick a really loud, noisy, unpredictable person to do the feeding, the cat may never like them, but it's a big help. Animals do love conditionally and they do love the people who take care of them the most. So if there's someone your cat or dog is not bonding with terribly well, put them in charge of feeding and treats. That's key, especially with dogs, because they'll warm up faster that way. There's a quote I have from Will Rogers, which I really like. He says, if there are no dogs in heaven, then when I die, I want to go where they went. Yeah, I'm of that. I'm of that sentiment. Well, definitely. I don't I don't understand how anyone can imagine an afterlife that's supposed to be perfect without animals. And you know what? In the scriptures, Jesus talks about horses in heaven. So if there's horses in heaven and Muhammad believed that dogs were blessed, oh, I'm thinking they're going to be there. I'm thinking they're going to be there. Dogs and cats are going to be in heaven because otherwise I don't want to go there just like Will Rogers. So, okay. So one more thing about dogs. Let's talk about dogs just before we go. The show's rounding up. We're almost out of time. But I had some interesting experiences lately where I discovered people don't know as much as I think they do. So I had someone contact me, emergency call, one of my customers. Oh my God. She said, I tried to breed my dog and they're breeding, they're mating but they're doing it the wrong way, she said in a panic, got very upset. And I had to explain to her <laughs> that dogs don't actually mate the way people do. They're not going to lie down the way people do. And it's not necessarily the position you would think that they take. In fact, dogs have about four positions. So when they're making puppies, they start with the female standing up and the male standing on top of her facing the same direction. But that doesn't last that long. Pretty soon, he will put one leg over, which is how the British come to that expression. Did he get his leg over? Yes. Yes, he did. He puts his leg over. And then so it's kind of awkward where they're almost standing side by side, facing the same direction and attached to each other. And that's that goes on for a little while. And then they sort of turn a little bit. So they're actually facing opposite directions and their two tails are close together. And they stand like that for a long time. And then sometimes they wander back to where they're facing together again. And then usually it ends. It lasts about 20 minutes at least, sometimes 40, sometimes an hour. So people are often unprepared for that too. And once they're locked, it is very dangerous to separate them. So once they're in this position, people think, oh, I'll just throw water on them. That's not going to do it. Water is not going to do it. The male anatomy of the dog is very different from humans, and it changes shape and size to the point where it cannot extract itself from the female until 
the fertilization process is finished. So they really are stuck together. That's true. And if they were to break apart, he would be very injured. So once that's happening, you really can't stop it. And it's very, very important to keep all other dogs away because you don't want them getting attacked when they're in this situation. And it is likely that they might be. Other males might want her. They might want to fight him. All kinds of damage can happen. So you have to make sure it occurs in a very safe place and keep them very, very protected until it's over. So that was one thing that I thought was really funny recently that I got this call. Oh, they're doing it the wrong way. What do I do? They know what they're doing. They're not doing it the wrong way. And I had another call recently from someone who asked me if I wanted to take her roosters. And I said, well, I guess so. What's wrong with the roosters? What are they doing? Are they fighting? What's, what's the problem? Because sometimes if you have too many roosters, they fight each other. They each like to have a harem of, of hens and they don't like to share. And, you know, they can have eight or 10 or even 20 hens following them around. And that's, that's good for them. The ratio is good for them. So they don't like to share. So sometimes people mistake that and they think, well, we'll get 10 hens and 10 roosters, bad idea. 10 hens, one rooster is a good idea. So anyway, so she calls me up and says, you know, can you take my roosters? And I'm like, what's wrong with the roosters? She said, they keep beating up the hens. I'm like, what? Well, they jump on top of them and they grab the back of their neck and it's just awful. I said, does it last for a few seconds? Yes. Does the hen seem disturbed? No. Does it happen all the time? Yes. (laughs) Okay, that's how chickens mate. That's lovemaking for chickens. He's not beating them up. He's just holding them still, which is essential so they can fertilize. That's all it is. And she doesn't mind. Like the lady said, no, they don't seem to mind. No, they don't seem to mind. This is how they do it. (laughs) He jumps on top. He has an opening. She has an opening. He fertilizes her. You know, the the, uh, the liquid goes from one to the other and she gets her eggs fertilized so they can be baby chicks. And it takes two seconds. It's so, so fast. But every hen ovulates once a day. So he is very busy and he always knows when they're ovulating. He knows when he has to get on there and he jumps. He's so quick. He runs over to the one that smells right and he jumps on her and he holds her steady and then he jumps off and he goes to the next one. So it does look a bit aggressive, but it's not. The roosters are not mean to the hens. The roosters might fight each other, but with the hens, they're very, very kind to the hens. They'll protect the hens. They'll protect chicks. They'll roll logs over so the hens can find bugs to eat. If a crow lands in the yard, the roosters run right over and deal with the crow. The hens just keep eating. The hens have no worries in life. They just do their thing. They lay their eggs and they preen. Oh, my. They spend a lot of time grooming their man. So they follow him around, cleaning him and making him beautiful. And he takes care of them. And this little wrestling that you see is normal and (laughs) and good and it makes everybody happy all the chickens and the rooster chickens are much much happier when a rooster is around so that's our little lesson on uh on chicken sex for today and uh i'll leave you with that on animal party on pet life radio and if you want to get a look at my beautiful standard poodles for sale you can check that out at uh doodlepoodlepuppies.com Or you can also go to our Camp Good Dog Facebook page where we have pictures of the doodles and the poodles, but also many of the dogs who've been coming to camp. And I must say, this has been a summer. I am just loving it. After the pandemic, when things were so slow and hardly anyone was traveling, now people are traveling and we're seeing dogs we haven't seen in a couple of years and new dogs too. The place is full. The dogs are happy. We are having a blast at Camp Good Dog. So if you want to check that out, go to Facebook, Camp Good Dog, and you'll see all the happy visiting dogs playing and swimming and romping on the farm. So from Animal Party and Pet Life Radio and me, Deb Wolf, thanks for listening and be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.